and mute you for the for the rest of the group. Okay. Fantastic. Hey, Luis, uh, apparently you're not on the interpretation line right now. You may not be dialed into the right Zoom number, it sounds like. Okay, let me, let me see. Um, I dialed. Bruce, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. <laughs> There is less uh, echo now. So Marcella, we hear you very well. And Luis, we're gonna I'm gonna let the IT team sort of communicate with you and we're we're gonna I think I'm gonna mute you here, but go ahead and communicate with the IT team if you can. Can we can we check? I'm I'm I dialed the number is four oh eight six three eight zero nine six eight. Is that the number? Can you guys, that is not the number where he's, Luis, if you can check the chat, uh, our IT team is communicating with you now. Perfect. Thank you. Bruce, okay. this is Tim. Can you hear me? Hi, Tim. We hear you very well. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll go on mute. Oh, and, and Bruce, I sent you my slides just in case I have a screw up on my side. Okay, we will uh, all access those and, and share them. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do it from my side, but just in case. Okay, great. Thank you. Ok, buen audio. Justicia Solitaria 06, Córdoba. Y en primera, Lorena. ¿Me acaban de enviar? ¿Salida? Sí. Ya. Sí, se tiene que preguntar. Bueno. Hey, Luis, uh, this is Bruce. Yes. Can you check your chat? Hey, this is Luis Arias on the interpretation line. Can you hear me? Yes, you're all okay. good now. Okay, Perfect. fantastic. Thank okay. you. Great. Good day, everyone. Uh, this is Bruce Streminger uh, with the ECHO Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I just want to welcome everyone to this special session of the U.S.-Mexico Binational TB ECHO Program, focusing today on the novel coronavirus COVID-19. And I want to thank our regular participants in our ECHO Program, as well as all the guest participants that are dialing in today. Uh, from the U.S., from Mexico, from Central America, and from Africa and beyond. I also want to really thank our uh, collaborators at the U.S. CDC with the Center for Global Health, who are going to be giving presentations today, as well as with the Ministry of Health in Mexico at INER and with the National TB Program. And I want to thank CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine that supports our regular U.S.-Mexico binational TV program and the New Mexico Department of Health. Um, I also want to thank our planning team and in particular Dr. Marcela Munoz at the National Institute of Respiratory Disease in Mexico City who, who requested that we try to put this special session together 
and everyone, including our CME office, who helped to do the planning, and our, our, our team that supports this program. So quickly, I want to just introduce the co-facilitators with me here in Albuquerque is uh, Dr. Marcos Burgos. Marcos, do you just want to say? Uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, the medical director of the tuberculosis control program in New Mexico and an infectious disease uh, clinician. Great, thank you, Marcos. And in Mexico City, we've got Dr. Marcelo Munoz. We've also got Diana Scotto with the CDC Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. And uh, we probably also have Omar Duran. Great, so one of my first announcements is just gonna be to remind everyone if you're not speaking to the entire group to please keep yourselves muted and we'll try to help with that. Um, but I wanna give uh, the microphone just uh, briefly to Dr. Munoz uh, to say a few comments to our colleagues in, in Mexico and in Latin America. Great, go ahead, Marcela. Thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, I'm very happy we are doing this uh, today. I think it's very important for us here in Mexico uh, to have this special meeting on the coronavirus. And uh, I welcome everyone here that is joining us today. Great, thank you, Marcela. I also wanna point out that Dr. Joaquin Cervantes in Juarez, Mexico, is, is also co-facilitating for the, the Mexico side. Um, we have a number of housekeeping things we'd like to go over quickly. So I'm going to bring up a couple of slides. There we go. Great, actually, uh, before I go over the the actual agenda, I just want to remind everyone we do have simultaneous English-Spanish interpretation. You should find the information for that in the chat, but it's also up here right now. Also, we would ask that if people, in order for us to take attendance, please write the name of your organization, the location and number of people in the room and send it to us by chat. That would help us keep track of how many people are joining us today. We know there are currently 267 sites dialed in, but we would, we'd like to keep track of a better sense of the numbers. Also, if you can rename yourself on Zoom so that we see the name of your institution or your name, that would be extremely helpful. Also a reminder, we will be giving continuing professional development credits at the end of the session. There will be a link to that, and you just need to fill out a short question questionnaire and then you'll get instant continuing professional development credits. Great, I think uh, in terms of the agenda, uh, we're just completing the introductions and we're then gonna go to colleagues at CDC. We're gonna start with Ron Mullinar who will give an overview of the global epidemiology. We'll then go to Chris Scheel who will be giving an overview of laboratory diagnostics. And then we'll have two presentations on infection control and prevention, one by Fernanda Lassa at the CDC. She's actually in Geneva today working uh, with the COVID-19 working group at the WHO and a colleague, uh, Jose Vera at the Ministry of Health at Senapress in Mexico City. After that, Tim Uecki, who is with CDC also, uh, will talk about clinical manifestations and management. And our last presentation will be Jose Orozco with INER, talking about the Mexican clinical algorithm and INER's experience. So the basic program is each presenter will talk for about 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes, and then we will take questions and discussion for about five minutes. So if you could send us your questions through the chat, that's how we will collect the questions. We will then read those questions as many as we can uh, with the five minutes that we've got, but questions that don't get answered, we plan to share with our speakers and hope to get uh, written replies and share those replies with everyone later. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and ask Dr. Mullinar 
with the CDC and, and Dr. Molinar is the uh, senior scientific advisor with the 2019 International Task Force on COVID-19. So Ron, uh, the floor is yours. And we're not hearing you quite yet. On the Zoom screen. All right, Ron, go ahead and, and uh, say yeah, something. Yeah, open try, that up. Okay, a little technical glitch. That's all right, here. we hear you now. Uh, share sure. that way. All right. Pick up. Share screen and pick what you want to share, which is your slide, right? right. Is it that? Oh, whichever one it is. Okay, perfect. How's that? Can you see that? Great. Yes, Ron. We're seeing your slides, and maybe just put it in presentation mode. All right. I hope you can hear me, uh, everyone. It's it's an honor to be with you. This partnership between uh, clinical medicine and public health and Mexico and the U.S. is really important for this response, so uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you. I'm going to talk about three main things in this short presentation. One is a brief overview of the background of this outbreak. Secondly, I'll review some of the basic descriptive epidemiology using a map and epidemic curves from the WHO situation report which if you're not familiar with, I hope to introduce you to. And then third, I'll briefly discuss an example of some US CDC guidance that you might find useful, this on exposure risk categories for non-health settings. And as uh, Bruce mentioned, there will be time for question and answer after the presentation, but if you uh, don't get a chance to ask a question, this, wet, this email box, EOC event 223, is a place you can reach or more questions. So as you probably know, the, uh, this outbreak emerged in Wuhan, China in December of 2019, and early on, many patients were reported to have had a linkage to a large seafood and live animal market. But later patients did not have exposure to animal markets, and that suggested person-to-person -person spread was occurring, and that has, in fact, led to uh, uh, travel-related exportation of cases around the world. For the U.S., the first case was reported on January 21st, and U.S. CDC is reporting confirmed cases of what we now call COVID-19 on, uh, online at our website. And this is the CDC coronavirus website that I highly recommend as a source for ongoing information. Most of what we know about how COVID-19 spreads is through um, other known coronaviruses. Investigations are still ongoing to better understand the route of transmission of this one, but it's presumed, presumed to occur primarily through close person-to-person -person contact, such as may occur when respiratory droplets are produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes. And it's also possible that touching a surface or object, getting the virus on the hands, and then touching the mouth, nose, or eyes could also be spreading this infection. Symptoms and complications, Dr. Uecki is going to go into much more detail on clinical features, but uh, fever, cough, and shortness of breath are the most common symptoms, and illness severity has ranged from asymptomatic to mild illness to severe cases or even death. The estimated incubation period is 2 to 14 days, and complications may include pneumonia, respiratory failure, and multi-system organ failure. This is an example of an epi curve, and this is uh, about a week old now. Um, everything changes quickly in this outbreak, so you have to stay on top of it every day. But it's an example that shows on the y-axis the number of cases, in this case confirmed cases, and on the x-axis is the date of reporting of the cases. And basically with this epi curve, you can see that the cases from uh, exposure to in Hubei province, or cases reported from Hubei province, which is the epicenter of the outbreak in China, are in dark blue. And in lighter blue are non-Hubei cases, and cumulative cases are the orange line. And the basic point of this is to show the outbreak. This next slide is from the WHO website, the situation report that comes out every day. 
And I'm gonna try and see if I can no ha introducido ningún número. Vuelve a introducir su ID de la reunión seguido de numeral. Um, you can also access through the WHO website and get a no. more updated version. But this map shows that uh, the epicenter is in the center of China, but that cases have been is important to know if you're going to understand what is communicated by the epi curve. For the WHO situation reports, they use the WHO case definitions. I'm not going to go into uh, detail on everything about the WHO case definition, but you can find them on the website. They have a definition of a suspect case, and then they have a probable case, which is a suspect case for whom testing for coronavirus, novel coronavirus 2019 is inconclusive or is positive using a pan-coronavirus assay without lab evidence of other respiratory pathogens. And then a confirmed case is a person with laboratory confirmation of uh, COVID-19 infection, irrespective of clinical signs and symptoms. And recently, China has revised their case definition for cases from Hubei. Um, they've had so many cases, and it's hard to do laboratory testing quickly on all of them, so they have decided a clinically confirmed, a clinically diagnosed case can be considered a confirmed case. And when they made that change in definition, it changed the epi curve uh, quickly. So this is the website that WHO uses to report their situation reports, and I highly recommend you check it out. Um, the, you click on the link for situation report and you will get an update um, daily. This is an example of an epidemic curve of COVID-19 cases with number of cases on the y-axis and date of symptom onset on the x-axis. And since many cases do not have date of symptom onset, this does not show the entire range of cases. These are cases from outside of China. This shows data for 172 cases, and the colors represent travel history. So you can see that in dark brown, uh, cases where there was a, an exposure, a travel exposure in Hubei, and orange is exposure in China, non-Hubei, and light orange is China, not known where the, what part of China, and then other colors represent no travel or travel outside of China. You can see that early on, most of the cases were associated with Hubei or travel in China, but subsequently, fewer cases are associated with that history. And that suggests that person-to-person uh, -person spread is more common or is occurring and is uh, the main route of transmission of the, of the outbreak. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron, it's Bruce. Can I just yes. ask you to speak just a little slower so our simultaneous <laughs> interpreter can keep up with you? Yes. Just a little slower. You're doing well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So... some reason, there we go. This is a similar epi curve to what I just showed. It's of COVID-19 cases identified outside of China, but this is by date of reporting. Date of reporting tends to be later than date of symptom onset, and it also has travel history. And it shows fairly dramatically cases from Hubei and Brown and other parts of China in orange, but cases associated with an international conveyance or cruise ship are shown in blue. And so you can see that the vast majority of recent cases have been occurring of, of the outside of China cases are accounted for by that international conveyance or cruise ship. Again, the WHO website is a good resource to get a daily update on the outbreak. Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, our U.S. CDC interim exposure risk categories outside of healthcare facilities. Again, I'd refer you to the website uh, shown here. This diagram is of an airplane, and the 
hypothetical infected traveler is in red in the center, and those in light green are considered to be medium risk close contact. And they are in the two seats directly adjacent to the infected traveler or the two rows in front of or behind, correspondingly, corresponding to about six feet of distance. That's considered a medium risk exposure for a close contact. Uh, low risk is in those same rows, but across the aisles, so further than six feet away, and no identifiable risk for the other travelers on the plane. And this, again, is interim risk exposure categories for non-healthcare setting, and that's on the website. Trying to advance the slide here, it's not cooperating. There we go. So the next three slides show guidance from CDC to categorize high risk exposures, uh, medium risk exposures, and low and no risk exposures. I'm not gonna read the whole slide. I'll refer you to the website, but just so you know that this exists, So as an example of a no identifiable risk would be interactions with a person with symptomatic lab confirmed infection, um, such as a risk such as walking by the person or be, being briefly in the same room, that's considered no identifiable risk. And for risk categorization for healthcare professionals, CDC guidance is posted at this website. And that is what I wanted to say. I will also refer you to an excellent article that just came out in the China CDC Weekly yesterday. That is their version of an MMWR, and it has the first descriptive epi data uh, in detail on the outbreak. Very useful article. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you, Ron, very much for that. We did not yet receive any questions via the chat. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask Dr. Molinar? Great. Well, it looks like for the moment... Oh, hey, Ron, do you mind stopping uh, sharing your screen so we can see everyone. Great, thank you. If anyone does end up having a question for Dr. Molinar, send it to us in the chat and we will, we've got one question which is, what about mobile persons in the airplane? Does the length of the flight duration affect infectivity? That's a really great question. I don't think we have enough data to completely answer that, but at this point, the, the risk categorization does not include information about the duration of flight. Great, and I see a, a question from one of your CDC colleagues, actually, uh, Steve Wiersma. What is the reference for the China CDC bulletin? Um, yeah, let me, sh I don't have the website. If you Google China CDC Weekly, you will find it. And uh, it's been online since uh, beginning of December. And the article that just came out shows a nice comparison of epi curves between uh, using uh, date of report versus date of symptom onset. And it shows a peaking of the epi curve at a different time, depending on which epi curve you, you use. But it does show what appears to be a peaking and fall off of the epidemic. They, they make a very careful statement that uh, they don't want to overinterpret that. And uh, there could be a backlash and more cases could occur. Um, so it's China CDC Weekly. If you Google it, you'll find it. Great. Thanks, Ron. One, one last question before we move on to, to Chris Scheel. Uh, one of our uh, participants asked, ch said, China's borders are not sealed. Does quarantine really work? What are your 
I, that's a big question, but if you maybe give a short answer to that, that would be great. That, that is a tough question. Um, there, were, there are some articles about to come out in the journal Emerging Infectious Disease, I bet, believe it is, that look at what we know about certain interventions, including quarantine and um, even, even things like uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions in communities, cl school closures, even things wearing masks, uh, washing hands, all these things that we sort of uh, take for granted as common sense. And um, we don't have just a whole lot of uh, evidence to show without a shadow of a doubt that they're all effective. Um, we do them because they make sense and uh, we need to study more, you know, which ones are effective and which ones aren't. But uh, I really I don't have any data that I can, you know, answer that question. Basically, it's a, it's a fair question. So thanks for it. But I don't really have a whole lot that I can say about it. Great. Thanks, Ron. And one quick question from your colleague, Elizabeth Bancroft, who is with the International Infection Control Team at CDC. If someone sits next to a person who is symptomatic on a long haul flight, will that be considered a high risk contact? According to the um, diagram with the infected traveler, um, a, sitting right next to the person a, who is symptomatic, a confirmed case would be considered a medium risk exposure. That's, that's the way they're doing it now. Again, there's not been enough time to gather a lot of scientific evidence to make those conclusions, but that's how they've divided it up at this point in time. They've considered that a medium risk exposure. Um, I, I'd say these are interim risk categorizations, and it's probably good to keep checking the website to see if anything changes the information becomes available, but that's how it's being currently categorized. Great. Ron, uh, Dr. Mulinar, thank you very much for that presentation. I think we're going to move on now to your colleague, Dr. Chris Scheel, who is the laboratory lead with the 2019 uh, COVID uh, International Task Force. So, Chris, the floor is yours. Okay. Trying to share screen. Give me one moment. This should be what you're seeing. No, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Do you see it? You just have to your presentation. Yeah, it's on the screen. Excuse me one moment. I'm sorry, folks. No, it's okay. Now it's not responding. <laughs> you're not you're funny. fine, Chris. Just take a moment. I'm sure. You okay, thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. I might have to move in Ron's spot. I'm having technical difficulties now. I'll try to cut that out. Cut make cut my talk a little. Okay. You see it now? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. As long as I can control it, and I can. All right, perfect. It finally, finally loaded. So Chris, um, Chris, we're actually not seeing it, so I think you have not shared your screen yet. Okay. So go ahead I, to the bottom of the window and. Yes, I'm. A, I I am on the bottom. And, and are you clicking on share screen? Share screen, but my um, the actual I can do this, but it's not the screen that. Um, no. Pull this it's, up. Now can you see your, it? We're seeing your Outlook calendar, which sure. looks beautiful. And, you I, look and the talk is right on top of it. <laughs> okay. New share. Okay, there we are. Now I've got it. Is that better? No, right. we're still seeing your Outlook calendar. Okay. There we go. We are oh, now perfect. seeing your presentation. You're good. I have no idea what happened there, folks. I'm very sorry about that. Um, you can see I have a very full calendar today, so I better get started. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about laboratory diagnosis of COVID-19 today. And um, first, uh, now I can't move my slides. Uh, okay. So, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's just taking a minute, and I think it's just a slow connection. 
So I'll be talking about coronavirus features, um, followed by various diagnostic tests, specifically CDC real-time PCR. Um, I'll be talking about things that that you need to do, things you need to think about before starting work with COVID-19, particularly risk assessment and also um, practicing laboratory biosafety from all throughout the specimen life cycle. I'm going to share a few coronavirus features because um, these are actually important to the initial assay development and you'll probably see why if you've run an assay um, for coronavirus. It's an enveloped uh, positive sense single strand RNA virus and it can use the host cell machinery to actually produce these proteins you see here. So it does have proteins. Um, the nucleocapsid is internal and it basically strings together the genomic DNA. The envelope protein, E is the um, letter for that, um, basically is this white protein you see here, um, around here. And then there's a membrane protein that spans the envelope. And then these spike pro proteins um, show red here. But we keep seeing this figure, so you know what they are. These are um, proteins that help um, coronavirus or COVID um, adhere to uh, the host cells. And these are not the only proteins in the virus. Um, there are other proteins associated with the virus that are currently being modeled right now publicly. And um, these are hope hopefully targets for either drugs or vaccines. Sequence of COVID-19. Um, was initially published by the Chinese when this outbreak first thing, because now we do have um, PCR assays um, by which to detect the, the infections. Um, here is an alignment showing how closely related it is to um, bat cov as well as the original 2003 SARS-CoV outbreak. And so these are human... Um, Sequences that were extracted from human specimens here, and between SARS-CoV and the BAT-CoV, they show about an 80 to 90 percent identity. In other words, they are very, very much alike. And the proteins we discussed earlier are shown here in this alignment. And um, I know some of the tests rely on sequences of these proteins, which is why I um, chose to show you some of this information. Um, the laboratory tests, there are many, and um, there are more than I can probably put on this slide and many I don't know about because the sequences, sequences have been available for some time and there are labs that are developing their own tests based on those sequence alignments as I showed you in the last, um, the last slide. But also there are five diagnostic protocols that are available on the WHO website laboratory testing for 2019 NCOV, which we now know as COVID-19 in humans. And there are five protocols, um, including the CDC protocol from the USA and the Germany protocol, which has many names, but that is a test that WHO has uh, distributed widely. But there are other protocols. Uh, China, they show the genetic primers and probes only. But one thing I'd like to point out is that all of these tests detect the virus directly in human specimens. There are no tests right now for um, human antibody reactions to um, this infection. And um, I think that is something that is being studied um, ongoing and particularly for uh, vaccine development. And I've also included links, if you'll notice, at the bottom of each page. I may or may not refer to them, but I um, encourage you to, to use them. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the CDC laboratory test. It's a real time, which means you can visualize the assay as um, the reaction occurs, reverse transcriptase um, PCR, which is an amplification of a DNA, um, a piece of DNA. And the reverse transcriptase is basically um, when the RNA that you um, 
input into the assay is transcribed into complementary DNA um, for this amplification step. And so that um, very long title, now you, um, if you didn't know, you know what that means. Um, this assay has been validated with both respiratory and um, specimens, um, oropharyngeal uh, and nasopharyngeal washes and swabs, bronchiolar lavage, um, tracheal aspirates, sputum, and also with serum, which um, sometimes um, you don't see that as often with PCR, so that's quite nice. Um, if you were to um, want to your samples, one of the first steps um, would be to extract the RNA from these human specimens. You would prepare um, a master mix, they call it, with the polymerase that would amplify the reaction. Um, and this would include these probes and primers in the CDC kit. And these have fluorophores that, as the reaction progresses, Um, cycles to make the amplification occur with the TAC polymerase, but also has a detector that detects fluorescence. And so that's why this real-time PCR is, is very interesting. But, but um, you would load your plate and put it in the, uh, basically this is an AB7500 FASTX, one of the many types of um, thermal cyclers with real, for real-time PCR and then run your test, and it could look something like this. And this is just an example of what it might look like, but, I, but this, these lines form as the assay runs, and basically um, you can see there's a threshold, which is like a cutoff, and um, here you see this is the number of cycles that it takes for this reaction to occur. The lower the number of cycles, or the fewer cycles, would um, indicate a positive um, test whereas very long cycles um, indicate negative samples. So that's a very simplistic way of how this um, test is visualized and interpreted. Okay, now I'm going to pedal back. I'm going to step backwards, and, and now I've talked a bit about tests, but what I'd like to um, describe is something that I feel is extremely important, which is um, you will want to um, prepare um, your labs. If you're going to work with COVID-19, there are several things that you should do to um, make sure that you're able to work with it. And the first of those um, would be a biological risk assessment. And I put a link here because WHO, I think it was last week um, perhaps, just released um, biosafety documents online, including um, the request to that all labs um, perform a biological risk assessment before working with COVID-19. Um, this is, um, it's done in business, um, but it's uh, common practice in labs, and if there are lab folks on this call, they've probably um, performed this type of risk assessment, but it begins with identifying hazards in the lab. Um, these can be based on the facility and the biocontainment. Um, do you have uh, biosafety cabinets, things like that? Also, the procedures performed. Are they, do they require mixing? Um, can, uh, you know, droplets, um, you know, fly around if you're mixing, mixing a biological agent? And the agent itself, um, how dangerous is that agent? Um, and then personnel. Are they uh, qualified to work with this? Are they new? Um, these kind of things are all considered when you're identifying potential hazards um, before you work with um, an agent and, and perform certain procedures. But the whole idea of the risk assessment is that you weigh the likelihood against the consequences of exposure. And so in this, um, on this end, we have low consequence. Um, so not a lot of bad consequences of exposure. It's a pretty safe organism. Um, and down here, very low likelihood. If you find yourself on this side, um, there's very little risk. And you might find that there are no additional measures that you would need to put in place to um, mitigate these risks. If you find that um, you end up in this end where you have either a high consequence, whether the likelihood is low or not, um, or um, higher likelihood and even lower consequence, 
you can still um, use some measures. PPE um, would be one way to mitigate risks in the lab. Another way would be to um, uh, administrative controls where you had uh, particular rules uh, as to how these procedures are performed so that accidents are less likely. And then um, other uh, measures could be engineering controls like biosafety cabinets and et cetera. And so what you want to do is bring high risk levels that are on this red and yellow part of the graph down into a safer area by using um, controls that we're all familiar with in the lab. And now we'll move on to um, laboratory biosafety. Um, now you know what your risks are. You've mitigated those risks in your procedures and documented that. But we want to make sure that you use appropriate biosafety during the life cycle of the specimen. And the life cycle of the specimen for the lab begins when it's transported from the clinic to the lab. If you're transporting within the same facility or intra facility, um, you know, triple packaging is very important, but you won't need to use um, special boxes um, with regulatory um, special. Some, somehow there's drawing on my screen. I'm sorry to, to laugh. Um, you won't have to use um, special packaging for that, but just carry them very safely. Um, for um, if you are shipping in country or internationally, um, you would use um, special packaging, and this is all listed in the de in the WHO publication, um, which basically recommends how international shipping um, how it's to be handled, and all reagents all, all agents excuse me biological agents are to be shipped category A or category B. Category B is um, a lesser um, le less stringent than category A. If you're transporting um, cultures of uh, COVID-19, it is category A, and that's uh, much stricter. So I encourage you to look at um, these guidelines by WHO if you are thinking about shipping um, any specimens or cultures of COVID-19. And then finally, um, you're manipulating a specimen. Um, that happens as soon as you receive the specimen because you have to examine it, make sure it's intact, make sure that it's of a quality, that it can be tested. And even if it's in a tube, this tube could have leaked. So any manipulation of that specimen from just first receiving it to the point of RNA extraction where you have open tubes, you need to do this work in a biosafety cabinet. And here is an image of a biosafety cabinet what that does is basically creates a wall of airflow that protects you from what's inside of this cabinet, which would be your organism. And so you'd be sitting outside with a sash, but the real protection comes from the airflow, the wall of air. So all work with COVID-19 needs to be performed in a biosafety cabinet. And then um, finally, the last um, cycle, the last part of the life cycle is waste management. And it, um, this is always very important for laboratories. Um, we, we manage our waste. We throw them away in biohazardous receptacles. Um, this is category B waste. Um, again, waste is also categorized. And this is, this is um, fairly common. Um, the rule here is that um, the waste should be autoclaved or incinerated before it's transported off-site to its final destination, which could, in fact, be um, like a landfill. So um, really, um, I guess the take-home message is um, risk assessment before using, before performing any work with COVID-19 is essential. Please visit the WHO website to find further resources that I've linked in this talk. And um, think about the specimen, the life cycle of that specimen and practice, um, use good biosafety practices from beginning to end. That's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Shio. Two quick questions from our audience. One is, does the test need to be done, performed in a BSL-2 or 3 lab? And the other is, from a colleague in Zimbabwe, what is the cost of the tests, and do we know anything about the sensitivity and specificity of the different tests? Hi. Um, the first question um, I can answer 
um, in that biosafety guideline that I shared, it does not have to be a BSO 3 lab. If you're using appropriate um, safety practices and you're working inside a biosafety cabinet, then it is a BSL 2 lab. And that is outlined in the WHO document. And um, for the second question, um, I think there are two. Um, the tests are very different. Some are nested PCR. Some are a little bit more complex, like the CDC assay that uses the fluorophores. Um, I think it's the CD. I can tell you that the CDC test is free of cost to certain influenza labs who have um, GISRA status. If they're in a network, they can order it online. Although it has not, um, it's currently not released but they can order it online through the um, international reagent resource. And if you work in a flu lab, you probably know what that is. But um, there is no cost to order it that way. Um, the other test, I haven't any idea. I do know, and I mentioned this earlier, the WHO has been distributing those um, German tests. Um, the sensitivity and specificity data for the CDC test is available on the FDA website. Um, under the EUA clearance that was done for the United States. So they can they show you all the specifications and um, different trials that the test went through. Um, so you can see that. And um, for the other test, I'm sorry, I, I think some of that data is available for the German test, but I'm not aware of the others. So you'd probably have to look at that website, um, the CDC. I mean, the WHO website that lists and links to all those protocols to get more information about that. Oh, thank Great. you. Great. Chris, uh, Dr. Shield, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I think we're going to collect those questions and get them to you, and we'll try and get the answers back to everyone. But I think we're going to move on now. Oh, thank you to Dr. Fernanda Lessa, who is also with us. Uh, Jose Gato. And Fernanda uh, is the... I Hold on, I'm just going to do a little muting there. Great. Uh, so Dr. Lessa is the infection control and prevention lead for the International Task Force at CDC on the coronavirus response. So Dr. Lessa. And Fernanda, you're still muted. Hello. You, yes, we hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so buenos dias a todos, todos los colegas de México y también a uh, los colegas de uh, otros países de Centroamérica y South uh, América del Sur. Soy médica infectóloga brasileña, entonces uh, hablo portuñol, voy a cambiar para lo inglés. I can't advance my slides. For some reason, it's not advancing. So, uh, Fernanda, if you can share your slides, go ahead and go down to the share button at the bottom, and uh, you should then be able to share your slides. Oh, I had I had I had the red share though. You're currently it, not sharing. It, go ahead and and press that share button, and then click on the. On the okay, PowerPoint. I think, okay, yeah. There you it go. should be, uh, We're okay. seeing it, we're seeing it. And then you'll want Perfect. to go into, you want to go into presentation mode. Yeah, it is on now. Excellent, we see it. Okay, exactly. perfect, perfect. Um, so I will be talking to you today about um, the U.S. perspective on infection prevention and control. And that's a little bit different from um, a WHO uh, perspective and what's recommending. And hopefully my colleague from Mexico, who is going after me, can talk a little bit more what Mexico is doing. So just bear in mind that this is the U.S. perspective. So as Rome said, and probably a team is going to be talking about this, so the symptoms of COVID-19 range from mild and even asymptomatic to more severe respiratory illness, and can include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. The symptoms may appear 2 to 14 days after exposure, 
which can be travel to China or exposure to a laboratory confirmed COVID-19 case within the past two weeks. Some patients may develop pneumonia, and those who are hospitalized with pneumonia, uh, a large proportion, around 70 to 75 percent, may develop bilateral pneumonia. Complications such as respiratory failure may occur, and uh, as Ron mentioned, there was a paper from CDC China that was published yesterday, and is the largest cohort of patients so far. They look at over 70,000 cases of COVID-19 and found overall mortality rate of 2.3%. And that mortality rate was higher in Hubei province, the epicenter of this compared to the rest of China. And why infection control is important? At this point, for COVID-19, we have no vaccine. We also have no approved antiviral treatment to date. Healthcare personnel are at high risk if infection control uh, is not followed. So at this point, in the strict infection control practice is the only way to stop SARS-CoV-2, which is the name of the virus causing COVID-19 from spreading. And all of us, we are responsible and can help with the spread of this disease. So let's talk about protection. CDC has published infection control recommendations in healthcare settings for COVID-19. And we are recommending standard, compact, and airborne precautions. So those patients with COVID-19 should be placed in an airborne infection isolation room, which is a negative pressure room with a minimum of six air changes per hour. In the PPE, it's going to be gown, uh, gloves, respiratory protection, which is an N95 or equivalent, and the eye protection. One thing that's very, very important is to know how to don and off your PPE. That's the only way you can protect yourself and limit the spread of contamination. So I'm going to go over uh, the donning process of the PPE. So all your PPE you should put on before entering the patient room. So the first thing that you're going to be putting on is your gown followed by your mask or respirator. And one thing that's important to check if you are wearing an NH5 is that it is, if you had done respiratory fit test, make sure that you, you've done that. And then that the mask is sealed, the NH5 respirator is sealed around your face, so there is no air escaping. So use, uh, after the mask, you're gonna put your goggles or face shield. And then the last thing is gonna be the gloves. And then those gloves are going to extend over your wrist of the isolation gown. Then um, the doffing of the PPE. So the first thing that they're going to remove, it's going to be the last thing that you put on, your gloves. And then after that, you're going to remove your goggles or face shields. And don't touch the front of your goggles. Everything should be from the back without touching the, the front of the goggles or the face shield. And then you're going to remove the gown. And the gown, again, your gown is contaminated on the front, so you have to remove from the back and really not touching the front of the gown. And then after leaving the room, you leave the room with the respirator on, and the, the respirator is going to be the last thing that you're going to remove outside of the airborne isolation room. And then after uh, you remove your respirator, then uh, you do the hand hygiene. One thing that's very, very important, uh, it is the implementation of uh, triage procedures. What we've seen so far with this outbreak, it is that the frontline physicians are the one at high risk of uh, getting the infection. So at uh, the numbers as of today, 
we have 1,716 healthcare workers infected, um, including an emergency care physician in the UK. Of those, 1,706 have died. So early detection and recognition of those symptoms, which I described earlier, that respiratory symptoms and history of travel to China or close contact with a person uh, known to have COVID-19 in the 14 days prior should prompt you to immediately isolate this patient. So put this patient in a private isolation room. Um, and face mask should be also given to the patient. And before you do any clinical examination, before entering the room, put your PPE on, and then you're going to access the clinical status. After you access the clinical status, then you're going to decide on the disposition of the patient, where that patient is going to be hospitalized, or if that patient is not severe and is not severe, doesn't have criteria for hospitalization, then that patient is going to be sent home. And CDC has developed a guidance for home care, and that's really important. WHO also have a guidance on home care, where it has uh, instructions on how this patient is this patient is going to be treated at home and uh, isolate that patient from the uh, family members. The other thing that is extremely important, if you are sending this patient back home, it is to give uh, the patient clear instructions. If the patient gets worse um, and needs reevaluation, that patient needs to call the hospital ahead of time to let the clinical staff know that he or she is coming. So the clinical staff is prepared to receive that patient. One question that we get all the time is related to discontinuation of isolation. And our recommendation at this point, it is to do this on case by case basis. And factors to consider include resolution of the symptoms, so resolution of fever, and, and resolution of the signs and symptoms of infection, and also a two negative PCR tests for COVID-19 at least 24 hours apart. And that includes the NEP and OP, so like both NEP and OP negative so uh, 24 hours apart. The other thing that you have to consider, if the patient develops any co-infection during hospitalization, I have to consider the type of co-infection, if it is MRSA or if that patient has developed uh, another multidrug resistant uh, infection. So those are the things that you have to take into consideration in the discontinuation of isolation. Uh, another thing that's super important, as I said, we really want to protect our healthcare personnel. So it is important outpatient uh, facility, emergency departments, you need to have visual alerts at the entrance to instruct patients that have respiratory symptoms to, to inform the healthcare personnel when they first register. The other thing that's important for you to have on your emergency department, it is signs that provide the patient education in respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. So they have to cover their nose, they have to cover their mouth if they are sneezing, if they cough. Um, they should be offered masks right away and hand hygiene is really important. In terms of environmental cleaning, the SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus. So the routine cleaning that you're doing in a hospital now and disinfection is sufficient. So any uh, disinfectant that you are using now for patients that are on MRSA isolation would work for um, the SARS-CoV-2. You have to focus mainly on frequently touched surfaces. Um, that it is the, the surfaces that are at uh, have higher likelihood to get contaminated. And we all can play a role in preventing the, the spread of COVID-19. 
Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching our eyes, nose, and mouth. And hand hygiene is key. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Or use alcohol hand sanitizer. There are several useful uh, resources. We have the CDC COVID-19 webpage. WHO has also a technical guidance um, document and several technical guidance documents that you, um, you can find through this link. WHO has also developed a FAQ for healthcare personnel. That's super, very, very helpful. CDC also has FAQ for healthcare personnel. And one thing that I want to point out, CDC in collaboration with WHO, we have developed infection control trainings. They are not specific for COVID-19, but really uh, provides you the, the, the best practice for infection control, including transmission-based precaution for respiratory illnesses. And it's free. And you can uh, find that through the link that I am providing on the slides. So with that, I want to say thank you to you all, and gracias a todos. Great. Dr. Lessa, thank you. Gracias. Uh, fabulous presentation. We have time for one quick question, maybe, uh, which was about how long will the virus survive on surfaces? Do we have any information about the length of time the viability of the virus is on surfaces? We don't. That's a great question. We don't. CDC is actually doing some experimental studies to look at the uh, stability of the virus on surfaces, but we don't have the, the data yet. Okay. Great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I think with that, we're in the interest of time going to, to pass the baton to our colleagues in Mexico. So Marcela, Dr. Munoz, do you want to introduce your, your colleague? And uh, Fernanda, do you mind stopping sharing your, your slide set? Hola. Great. Gracias, Marcela. Bueno. Eh, eh. Vamos a presentar al doctor eh, José Antonio Zulca Vera del Programa Nacional de Tuberculosis. Él es el asesor en eh, control de infecciones del Programa Nacional de Tuberculosis. Va a hablar del de control de infecciones desde la perspectiva de México. Adelante, José Antonio. Hola a todos, ¿me escuchan? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you, Marcela, and thanks, Professor. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a great honor to do this presentation. And if you don't mind, I would like to do my presentation in Spanish. Dr. Vera, uh, this is Bruce in Albuquerque. Can you please get closer to the microphone? We're having a little trouble hearing you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me better? Better, but as close as you can get. <laughs> okay, it's fine. I put my presentation in my in my screen. Give me a second. Está bien. Está bien. Bien. Eh, antes que todo, eh, gracias por la oportunidad, lo mencioné. Aquí simplemente es mencionar los antecedentes. Y bueno, antes que todo, declaro abiertamente no tener conflicto de interés alguno. Primero que todo, saben ustedes que en México todavía no hay reporte de casos confirmados de COVID-19. Estamos eh, preparados con los protocolos. La Secretaría de Salud ha preparado los protocolos. Sin embargo, esta presentación la pretendo hacer más que todo con una cuestión complementaria a mis predecesores. Puedo complementar mucha información con lo que la doctora les 
se mostró previamente. Eh, bueno, se trata de México. Como bien saben, tenemos la experiencia del año 2009 a raíz de, de, la, de la epidemia, pandemia de influenza. Y puedo mencionar algunas cosas en particular. Yo eh, provengo de, del Perú, soy nacido en el Perú. Vengo, me tocó vivir dos epidemias, dos pandemias grandes. La primera fue en el año 94, el, con el cólera del cual nació, para, salió para toda América Latina. Y la segunda fue particularmente ya como colaboradora del programa nacional. Participamos en lo, que se, en lo que respecta a la pandemia de influenza del 2009. Y en ambas situaciones ocurrieron cosas muy, muy, muy similares. En ambas lo que se trató en un principio fue de minimizar el problema. Y ese tal vez sea el principal error cuando se, se trata de pandemias desde una perspectiva gerencial y política el catarrito, o nunca nos va a pasar, o no tenemos casos, pero la realidad es que ese es un error muy frecuente, por lo cual nosotros ahora tenemos que reconsiderar las lecciones aprendidas del pasado, en este caso, ya más de 10 años de la influenza durante el año 2009. Y en ese escenario, esto es lo que encontramos al momento de hacer las estrategias relacionadas a cómo prevenir las infecciones, hablando de, de enfermedades de gotas o enfermedades transmitidas por aerosoles, en este caso la tuberculosis, por tratarse de partículas que van en de menos de 5 micras para TV y de 5 a 12 micras en el caso de la transmisión por gotas, donde tal vez podría catalogarse el COVID-19. Y en ese sentido, pues estos son los escenarios en los cuales México tendría técnicamente que prepararse para poder eh, dar respuesta ante eh, esta enfermedad si llegara a presentarse casos. De momento podemos decir que estamos, estamos tranquilos preparados pero tranquilos. Y esto es la Ciudad de México, el escenario ideal para muchas situaciones. Es el metro. Aquí en la Ciudad de México vivimos más de 20 millones de personas y en el país somos más de 120, 120 millones de personas las que estamos aquí día a día interactuando. Y más allá de, de lo complicado que puede ser la cuestión social en esta enorme ciudad y de la cual muchos de ustedes seguramente han tenido oportunidad de conocer, es todo lo que uno se puede exponer en ese sentido, ¿no? Durante el 2009 mencioné lo que nos pasó, el, el tema de, de transmisibilidad, y ni qué decir de lo abarrotados que estaban nuestros sistemas, nuestras unidades de salud, en cada una de las instituciones a las que pertenecemos. Y, y bueno, y ahora viene el COVID, del cual todavía tenemos fragmentos de información tal vez poco claros, pero que al final con ello tenemos que hacer algo para estar preparados al momento en el que existan estas, estas eventualidades, por así decirlo. Eh, y traspolando esta experiencia previa de lo relacionado a la transmisión de enfermedades por gotas o por aerosoles, pues nosotros en el programa nacional, inicialmente, casi como siempre sucede en el principio de cualquier intervención o estrategia, información relacionada a, la, a cómo pues, evitar enfermedades eh, por aerosoles o por gotas, particularmente en el caso de la TV, que era lo que empezábamos en ese momento, pues era que no teníamos, eh, no teníamos información, por así decirlo, de un indicador que es sensible para eso, que es el de trabajadores de la salud que pudieran presentar tuberculosis. Y esto a raíz de que durante la influenza tampoco teníamos este dato cierto de cuántos, aunque habían reportes, eh, daba la apariencia de que la información no era del todo eh, específica, por así decirlo pero teníamos que partir de algo, era nuestro indicador de gravedad, más aún cuando estas personas, estos trabajadores de la salud se encontraban expuestos. Y bueno, ni qué decir de lo que nosotros en su momento dábamos por hecho, de que el lavado de manos o la higiene respiratoria era algo que asumíamos en su momento que el personal de salud desarrollaba, pero al momento de que entra la influenza simplemente esto evidenció y por supuesto abarrató, abarrató la respuesta de, eh, del sistema de salud. Así también, pues desconocíamos muchas cosas sobre los mecanismos de transmisión y más aún, otra situación muy, muy particular era de que los establecimientos de salud no, no teníamos un ser con certeza si en realidad desde un punto de vista estructural se encontraban preparados para poder se, separar pacientes o en su momento aislarlos para poder de alguna forma evitar el contagio dentro de las instituciones. Y esto también evidenció que en el tema de prevención y control de infecciones 
TV, de influenza, pues las normas eran todavía, estaban en construcción. Eh, habíamos tomado como referencia la, la, las que se desarrollaron durante la pandemia del 2003-2004 con el SARS, eh, y esperábamos algo así, sin embargo, el escenario fue otro, con el H1N1, y ni qué decir ahora con la tuberculosis. Entonces, esto no soy yo, bueno, esto en realidad es más el tema de tuberculosis, no voy a andar tanto en, 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 en desarrollar esto, pero lo que sí debo mencionar es que la, la enseñanza que nos dejó el intervenir eh, prevención y control de infecciones de TB es que aunque nosotros desarrollábamos actividades tales como la separación de personas con sintomatología respiratoria, el triage, la priorización de los casos con patología respiratoria o que pudieran parecer como casos probables de TB, nos, do como, nos dio como un resultado eh, no esperado y por supuesto un plus, un, un producto agregado que pudiéramos también incidir en las demás enfermedades, aunque buscábamos tuberculosis, eh, al hacer la priorización también le, le podíamos este, hacer búsqueda de personas con enfermedad respiratoria y eso en el primer nivel de atención, en los establecimientos de concentración, fue algo que de alguna manera permitió mejorar la búsqueda de casos probables y por supuesto reducir la transmisibilidad de las enfermedades este, que, que acabo de mencionar. Eh, eso también nos permitió a nosotros aprender y, y reaprender lo relacionado a la estructura sanitaria y las medidas de, relacionadas a la ventilación, en este caso optimizar eh, ventilación natural, evaluar un tanto lo que es la evaluación mecánica central de ciertos establecimientos de salud y por supuesto involucrar más actores. Nos encontrábamos de que al momento de hacer las reuniones de la evaluación de establecimientos de salud, quien se encargaba del mantenimiento del establecimiento, los ingenieros en, en sistemas de ventilación, no participaban en las reuniones de, de, de infecciones nosocomiales dentro de los hospitales. Por ello, ellos nunca estaban enterados de que su participación era importante. Y algo que también nos permitió es contar con los administradores para que pudieran re, eh, canalizar los recursos para fortalecer la estructura sanitaria. Aprendimos de que a veces los médicos solamente ven pacientes, pero si los involucramos a ver el entorno en común, las acciones para, para prevenir las infecciones nos salían muchísimo más, más eficientes. Y el tercero, que fue algo muy interesante, fue el de lo relacionado a la protección respiratoria, el uso de los cubrebocas eh, o mascarillas quirúrgicas y el uso de los respiradores de partículas, en este caso el N95, que la mayoría de las personas querían tenerlas, pero que desconocían eh, cuáles eran su aplicación, si necesitaba hacerse pruebas de ajuste, etcétera, y de alguna manera incluso mitificó que, te, que, que se utilizara eh, eh, mascarillas quirúrgicas, incluso hasta ventas en mercado negro, porque pensaban que esa era la panacea para evitar enfermarse por, por, por esas enfermedades respiratorias. Entonces, al final, eh, eh, hacer diagnósticos iniciales como estrategias de salud y posteriormente hacer intervenciones muy sencillas que aunque, vuelvo a lo mismo, estaban inicialmente enfocadas para tuberculosis, le pegaban, digamos, se permitía también resultados con otras enfermedades eh, respiratorias. Y esas acciones, pues, fueron, bueno, ya lo mencionó la doctora Alesa previamente, que consistían en el asunto de la aplicación de triajes, la separación de, de casos probables, la priorización de pacientes con enfermedad respiratoria y con ello evitando precisamente el contagio en el interior del establecimiento donde compartían el mismo espacio personas con VIH, personas con diabetes, niños menores de 5 años, eh, etc. Eso también nos permitió desarrollar evaluaciones y enseñar a la gente sobre la importancia de la ventilación en el tema de enfermedades respiratorias eh, y sobre todo eh, hacer evaluaciones de riesgo, so, eh, específicamente en la ventilación mecánica, porque habían establecimientos de salud en los cuales no se hacía la evaluación de los ductos de ventilación y había reportes de legionela, pero estos no eran considerados en su momento, eh, lo cual nos permitió fortalecer, es decir, nos permitió hacer diagnósticos y mejoras en espacios donde nosotros no habíamos incidido antes y que además 
permitió conseguir recursos para poder fortalecer la infraestructura sanitaria de los establecimientos de concentración de enfermedades respiratorias. Así también nos permitió capacitar al personal sobre la importancia del uso de los respiradores de partículas, en este caso los, los N95, y el poder enseñar a la gente sobre la importancia de hacer pruebas de ajuste. Muchas personas pensaban o piensan que el solo respirador sin evaluación es suficiente para poder atender enfermedades respiratorias, cosa que es una sensación de falsa seguridad y que expone a los, a los trabajadores de la salud de manera innecesaria. Y por supuesto, el uso de las mascarillas quirúrgicas. Hoy ya, bueno, tenemos, hemos desarrollado capacitaciones en los estados. Muchos de, de estos afortunadamente hablan del tema de control de infecciones en tuberculosis y de enfermedades respiratorias. Nos ha permitido con ello, con estos resultados, tener sistemas de reporte en línea en tiempo real y abrir las variables que nos permiten hacer monitoreos como es el de los de ocupación, el trabajadores de la salud, desarrollar asistencia técnica en terreno y a distancia a través de sesiones virtuales, e incluir dentro de las normativas nacionales el tema y con ello poder hacer guías de práctica clínica que le permitan lo, al personal de salud desarrollar, es desarrollar esas acciones, el análisis de la información de manera frecuente y la evaluación de los establecimientos de manera regular, eh, porque esto permite preparar este, precisamente ante situaciones como esta del COVID-19, tener establecimientos preparados. Eh, les enseñamos a que no todo lo que diga aislamiento respiratorio en realidad lo es, para ello se tiene que desarrollar evaluaciones, eh, todo esto a veces lo hacíamos de manera rudimentaria tomando las, las recomendaciones del CDC en cuanto al número de recambios, la cuestión estructural y por supuesto eh, todo lo relacionado a medición de, de flujos de aire. Todo estaba, eh, digamos, fundamentado con lo que CDC recomienda, pero nosotros pues lo aplicábamos dependiendo del lugar en el que nos encontremos, hacíamos, utilizábamos cartones, cosas rudimentarias, pero al final lo, lográbamos el objetivo de alcanzar de entre 6 a 12 recambios de aire por hora necesarios para evitar esto en los cuartos de aislamiento. La gente, eh, la, les enseñamos a los, a los eh, quienes se encargan del mantenimiento de la infraestructura a evaluar los espacios y lo cual generó bastante buena respuesta. Solamente ya para terminar, hago el comercial eh, de las recomendaciones de 2019 sobre lo que es el control de infecciones en tuberculosis y eh, afortunadamente para nosotros la, en la última guía, las recomendaciones de las, de las tantas recomendaciones que existían desde el 2009-2012, hoy se concentran solamente en siete que están descritas aquí como parte de la estrategia. Eh, creo que estas acciones benefician mucho a, a estar preparados para la respuesta de, de, como una estrategia de prevención y control que aunque es, eh, costo, es, aunque es costosa, sigue siendo de mayor beneficio para la población aquí en México. Y bueno, eh, esperemos, esperemos seguir todavía sin la presencia de COVID en México. Sin embargo, nos preocupa porque también lo que aprendimos es que las enfermedades se comportan diferente dependiendo de las poblaciones a las que afecten. Y eso pues seguramente nos va a tener ocupados mucho tiempo. Muchísimas gracias por su tiempo. Gracias, doctor José Antonio Zulca Vera, uh, por su presentación. Eh, eh, porque no tenemos tiempo, estamos un poquito sobre el tiempo, no van a haber preguntas y vamos a seguir con el siguiente eh, eh, ponente. Eh, por favor. Ah, y por favor, si puede eh, dejar de compartir su presentación, doctor. Ah, gracias. Great, gracias. Thank you. And uh, next, we're, we're going to move to Dr. Tim Uwecki with CDC in Atlanta. And Tim is, is going to talk about the clinical manifestations and management of COVID-19. Um, good afternoon. Are you able to see my slides? Not quite yet. If you could share your screen. Yep, I have done that. We see it black, but we don't see anything else. Okay, um, let me try another one. Let's try. I don't uh, think you're sharing quite yet, Tim. If you go down to the bottom and click yep. on that green share button. Yep. Okay. I've done that. 
um, okay it looks like it's coming through now great and now if you can enlarge that to presentation view um, now I've lost the screen okay. we're, we're seeing the presentation great okay but if you just click on the presentation view uh, button there at the bottom of the PowerPoint. And you see it now? Go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. okay, great. Sorry about that. So um, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the clinical manifestations and management of COVID-19 patients. So um, one of the things um, that's not well worked out is the incubation period. It's in a number of studies, a median of about five days. Uh, we are using a range of two to 14 days, which also includes data from SARS-associated coronavirus and MERS coronavirus infections of humans. So approximately five days, but a wide range of two to 14 days. Uh, majority of patients manifest fever, uh, but not all. Um, and many patients manifest cough, initially dry cough. Some patients may have productive cough later in the clinical course. Uh, myalgia or fatigue are noted in some patients, um, and about a third of patients have shortness of breath, particularly later in the clinical course. Gastrointestinal symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea are less common, about 10% reported in one case series. And less common signs and symptoms include sore throat, uh, productive cough, headache, hemoptysis, and diarrhea. Um, there have been some reports of diarrhea and nausea preceding fever and lower respiratory tract signs and symptoms. There is a wide range of clinical severity, as you've heard from other colleagues. And this can vary from asymptomatic infection um, in the uh, recent China um, CDC weekly report, um, of all the cases in China, they reported about 1% were asymptomatic. Um, majority of patients have mild to moderate respiratory illness. Um, it's about 80 to 81% reported in the large China um, case series or, or data. Um, about 15% of patients manifest uh, severe illness and a smaller percentage have critical or fatal illness. Overall, signs and symptoms of illness and even uh, during the clinical course are very nonspecific. One thing to note is that fever can be intermittent or prolonged 10 days or more. A very important point is that even if a patient is very clinically stable with mild illness during the first week, there is potential for clinical deterioration to lower respiratory tract disease during the second week of illness. And this may occur out late in the second week of the illness. So in some different case series from China, the median time from onset to dyspnea was eight days. The mean time in another case series from onset to hospitalization with pneumonia was nine days. Overall, mortality in, reported in one pneumonia case series, all hospitalized pneumonia patients. A couple case series have ranged from 4 to 15 percent. But in the data released by uh, the China CDC uh, this weekend, case fatality among all reported cases, so mild, moderate, asymptomatic, and um, critical illness, was 2.3 percent overall. Risk factors for severe disease um, seem to include older age. So older adults, particularly uh, over 60 years of age, with uh, higher mortality in those 70 and 80 years of age. About one third to one half of reported pneumonia patients who have been hospitalized in China have had underlying uh, chronic comorbidities that include diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. To date, there have been very few reports of pediatric patients in the large uh, China data set uh, released this weekend. Um, about 2% of all patients were aged less than 20 years. So not many pediatric patients have been reported with this illness. And of those that have, majority have experienced mild illness. 
So commonly at laboratory admission, sorry, at hospital admission or uh, slightly thereafter in the clinical course, um, patients may manifest leukopenia. Uh, some later in the course may manifest leukocytosis. Uh, more common is lymphopenia, particularly early on in the clinical course. Um, and a, a more than a third of patients have elevated uh, hepatic transaminases, and this may occur about a week into the disease and particularly uh, into the second week of the clinical course in more severely ill patients. Uh, most patients um, in, in which data were available have had normal serum levels of procalcitonin at hospital admission. And radiographic findings uh, include bilateral involvement in most patients, uh, although some have had unilateral abnormalities um, with multiple areas of consolidation and ground glass opacities. Here are some examples of, um, in particular, chest CT scans and admission um, chest x-ray uh, in one patient. And what this highlights is that um, you can see uh, multifocal areas of ground glass opacities and consolidation, particularly at day 9 and 15, um, and then resolution by day 19. In China, most patients have uh, received chest CT scans. Chest CT scans will pick up um, abnormalities um, much more than uh, chest radiograph. Chest CT is much more sensitive. Uh, virologic findings. So um, we're still learning about about uh, viral shedding and in particular the duration of viral RNA detection, but um, um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA has been detected in the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract, and preliminary data suggests that this may be detectable for about one to four weeks after illness onset, so a very wide range of um, um, uh, periods of detection of viral RNA in the upper respiratory tract. Um, the virus has only been isolated to date from the upper respiratory tract specimens and lower respiratory tract, a bronchial lavage fluid specimen. What we don't know is actually the duration of infectious virus replication. So while RNA of the virus may be detectable for several weeks, we don't know if that represents infectious virus or not. Um, also, um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA has been detected in extrapulmonary specimens that include blood and stool. But we don't know to date whether or not detection of viral RNA in blood or stool actually represents detection of infectious virus simply not known to date. We know there's infectious virus in the upper and lower respiratory tract, but we don't know about extra pulmonary uh, tissue specimens. So in terms of clinical management and treatment, um, you heard Dr. Lessa uh, mention the importance um, for a patient to be managed in an airborne infection isolation room if available, and that CDC recommends uh, implementation of standard contact and airborne precautions along with eye protection when caring for a patient with COVID-19. Um, you've also heard that patients with mild illness may not require hospitalization and decisions to monitor a patient uh, in the hospital or in the outpatient setting or at home should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. This depends upon clinical severity, signs and symptoms, and in particular, the ability of whether or not this individual can be isolated at home safely away from household contacts. Um, and this has to take into account the risk, the potential for um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission in, within the patient's home environment. So clinical management and treatment is actually very straightforward. There is no available approved specific treatment for COVID-19 patients that is um, available. Um, one important uh, point is that corticosteroids should be avoided unless indicated for other reasons. So for example, if the patient has underlying COPD and is having an exacerbation, that might be one indication for 
corticosteroids. If a patient is having refractory septic shock, that might that is an indication for uh, hydrocortisone uh, per surviving sepsis campaign uh, guidelines. Um, but in general, corticosteroids should be avoided for treatment of COVID-19. So overall, clinical management is supportive. I attach the web link for the CDC clinical management guidance. Um, at the bottom is the link for the WHO clinical management guidance. So some patients may require supplemental oxygen. Others may require advanced organ support. Overall, among all patients reported in China, 5% um, uh, required intensive care um, admission for respiratory support. And in some case series of pneumonia, about 22 to, 23 to one third of all the cases required um, um, uh, ICU admission. And this might be for non-invasive ventilation, it might be for invasive mechanical ventilation, and some patients um, with refractory hypoxemia have required ECMO. Complications um, most severe are um, ARDS, septic shock, multi-organ failure, and arrhythmias have been reported in one China case series. Um, China reported that of all critically ill patients, mortality was very high, about 49% uh, overall. So uh, as I mentioned, there are no um, therapeutics uh, that have been uh, approved, uh, certainly none in the US, none with demonstrated efficacy. Um, there are in vitro and in vitro studies, sorry, in vitro and in vivo studies um, for uh, other coronaviruses, SARS-associated coronavirus and uh, MERS coronavirus that do suggest uh, activity of certain um, drugs that are available. Um, there are There is one published in vitro study indicating um, some activity against uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, we can report that some patients in a number of countries, including the US, have received investigational therapeutics for compassionate use on an uncontrolled basis. Um, we're unable to draw inferences from um, that use, a single patient uncontrolled use. The good news is that there are some randomized controlled clinical trials of investigational drugs that have been implemented among hospitalized COVID-19 patients with pneumonia in China. This includes a trial of remdesivir, which is an in intravenous nucleoside analog. It also includes um, a clinical trial of lopinavir ritonavir, which uh, many of you know are protease inhibitors used for HIV uh, treatment. There are a number of other drugs under investigation, particularly in China, and there are um, uh, clinical trials that are protocols that are being developed uh, in the U.S. and other parts of the world. So to summarize some key points, most patients with COVID-19 experience mild to moderate illness. In the United States, we have only had 15 COVID-19 patients to date. All have been adults, none have been in pregnant women. We have had no deaths, no critical illness. We have had nine pneumonia patients, but again, none have been critically ill. Some have required supplemental oxygen and one required high flow nasal cannula um, oxygen. Um, there are very nonspecific signs and symptoms of resp acute respiratory illness in the first week of the illness. Uh, some patients will have clinical worsening to pneumonia, uh, particularly in the second week of the clinical course, and this can be actually be late in the clinical course. We have had one patient in the U.S. that was very stable until day 12 of illness and deteriorated, and that is the patient that required 20 liters of nasal can of high flow nasal cannula oxygen. Um, risk factors for severe and critical illness are um, older adults and persons with comorbidities. Clinical management is completely supportive. So it's uh, management, as you would, of community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, please avoid corticosteroids unless indicated for specific reasons. 
And um, just to note that there are a number of clinical trials of investigational therapeutics either in progress or planned. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Uh, Dr. Uwecki, thank you very, very much. I have one, if you could stop sharing your slides, that would be great. One quick, two quick questions. One was uh, the issue of thrombocytopenia, and if you could comment on that. And the other question is the utility of wearing an N95 mask, which either could be for you or Dr. Lessa. So in terms of uh, platelet count and thrombocytopenia, um, uh, we, what has been observed, uh, at least from the U.S. patient experience, is that uh, typically there is uh, mild to moderate thrombocytopenia. Um, it is not a significant thrombocytopenia, and it does resolve um, as the clinical illness resolves. Great. Thank you. And any comment on the N95 question, or, or do you want to defer that one? Uh, I don't know if Dr. Lessa wants to address that. Um, we may or... come back to Dr. Lessa. She may have stepped away. So, uh, Dr. Uwecki, thank you very much. We have one more presentation. I know we're, we're at, at the official top of the hour or bottom of the hour. Um, so for those who have to leave, uh, who, who needed to go at this point, we just want to remind everyone that CME and continuing education credits are available. And we put a link in the chat, and we really want your feedback about the session. So we ask you to take one or two minutes to give that feedback. In return for that, you'll get 90 minutes of CME or CNE credit. But with that, I'm going to ask my colleague, Dr. Marcos Burgos, to introduce our last speaker. Y el siguiente ponente es el Dr. José Arturo Martínez Orozco eh, de, de con el INER. Eh, por favor, Dr. Orozco, tiene el podio. Podio virtual, si puede compartir su presentación. Hola, sí, muy buenas tardes a todos, muchas gracias por la invitación. Entonces les voy a presentar. A ver sí. si la pueden ver. Ah, sí. Esta no es. Doctor Orozco. Listo. Ustedes pueden poner la presentación por mí. If we can put the presentation do we have We will share that for you from our end. Hold on a few seconds. Doctor Orozco, en un momento vamos a, a, a poner su presentación, por favor, espere. Okay. Doctor Orozco, ahí está. Cuando quiera que pase a la, a la, a la, la, la el, el slide nos dice. Ok, muy bien, muchas gracias. Bueno, el día de hoy les voy a hablar sobre lo que hemos trabajado en México y en el Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias para la respuesta ante la llegada de SARS-CoV-2, eh, causante de COVID-19. Eh, si me pasan la siguiente. No tengo conflicto de interés, con la siguiente. Lo que podemos ver es que, bueno, al día de hoy se han diagnosticado, se han buscado... Eh, SARS-CoV-2 en 16 casos sospechosos en México, en varios estados de la República, por medio de RT-PCR, los cuales los 16 han sido negativos y al día de hoy no tenemos algún caso sospechoso en la República. La que sigue, por favor. Eh, el día 14 de febrero, eh, varios especialistas del país e integrantes de otras asociaciones no médicas, sino también gubernamentales, eh, escribimos los lineamientos para la atención de pacientes eh, por COVID-19 y que hablan principalmente sobre la atención hospitalaria en primero, segundo y tercer nivel de atención médica. La que sigue. Podemos ver ahí eh, un poco de esta guía que lo que se basa básicamente es el manejo en centros de primer contacto, primer nivel en los, en los centros comunitarios, 
y posteriormente cómo referir a los pacientes a un segundo y tercer nivel y en los tercer en los centros de tercer nivel cómo hacer el manejo de, eh, del SIRA del a, eh, acorde a los criterios de Berlín para los pacientes eh, con sospecha o diagnóstico confirmado de COVID-19. Y asimismo, eh, en caso de declararse una epidemia, una pandemia, y que tuviéramos más casos, eh, nosotros hacemos una eh, solicitamos una cosa que se llama reconversión hospitalaria, donde asignamos centros que pueden ser los que pueden recibir pacientes críticos o graves con neumonías por COVID. En este caso, uno de ellos el Instituto de Enfermedades Respiratorias. ¿La que sigue? Aquí les estoy mostrando el programa de identificación de un caso sospechoso, sospechoso de COVID-19. Lo que les voy a presentar rápidamente son los flujogramas de atención que ya están publicados a nivel nacional para unidades de atención de primero, segundo y tercer nivel, tanto para cómo sospechar del caso, cómo abordarlo, cómo diagnosticarlo y cómo referirlo oportunamente. Y una vez que esté dentro de los hospitales, saber cuál va a ser el flujo de ese paciente con dos objetivos principales, la atención temprana del paciente y evitar el contagio de SARS-CoV-2 a otros pacientes y principalmente a eh, trabajadores de la salud. En este flujograma de identificación lo que podemos ver es que tiene que cumplir con la definición operacional de caso sospechoso, acorde a la OMS y a nuestros criterios de la Dirección General de Epidemiología. Si se cumple con ese caso sospechoso tanto desde un domicilio como desde una clínica de primer contacto, de segundo nivel o tercer nivel, se tiene que hacer una llamada a un teléfono único que se designó a nivel nacional para que se pueda orientar al paciente o al médico sobre eh, cómo abordar al paciente en cuanto al diagnóstico y enviarlo a un primero, segundo o tercer nivel de atención. Una cosa muy importante es que ahí en ese centro telefónico, si el paciente está estable y no requiere ir a un centro de evaluación clínica, eh, se le da instrucciones de quedarse en su casa por 14 días en un aislamiento y se le dan signos y síntomas para saber si el paciente puede ir a recibir atención médica. ¿La que sigue? Aquí vemos el, también otra parte importante, un flujograma que se hizo a, a, a los contactos a los contactos de pacientes que están sospechosos o confirmados de COVID-19, donde básicamente es exactamente lo de el, ma el manejo de un caso sospechoso. Que son contactos que se van a seguir, se les va a informar que estuvieron en contacto con un caso sospechoso y en este mismo flujograma se les da el teléfono ante la, ante la presencia de síntomas que sugieran una infección respiratoria causada por COVID-19 o en ocasiones síntomas gastrointestinales que sí se han presentado. Si es esto, bueno, se refieren todos a un primer nivel para la, la toma de caso y para el diagnóstico y para la toma de muestra de, de, del hisopado nasofaringio en estos casos. ¿La que sigue? Aquí estamos viendo el primer flujograma en primer nivel de atención donde lo ideal de este flujograma es saber que el médico y el paciente deben de llevar ciertas precauciones, tanto de contacto como de gotas respiratorias. Y bueno, lo que eh, sugerimos es que el paciente que está recibiendo la atención porte una mascarilla quirúrgica, asimismo el médico que lo está valorando, que haga una buena definición clínica del caso y si en la exploración ya con sus medidas de protección personal que se recomienda según la OMS, tiene la sospecha de coronavirus, se tiene que notificar vía telefónica para que se acuda para la toma de muestra y el envío a un centro de referencia. Aquí lo importante es que en todas las unidades de primer nivel del país, en cada estado de la república tienen un centro que puede diagnosticar coronavirus 2019. La capacitación esta semana se está dando en México. Y bueno, ya todos los estados, los 32, más dos centros extras en la Ciudad de México, como el Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias, donde laboro, y otro instituto, harán el diagnóstico de eh, SARS-CoV-2 eh, para eh, usuarios de primer nivel. Eh, ¿La que sigue? Para segundo, eh, para segundo de nivel de atención es básicamente lo mismo, eh, identificar adecuadamente al caso, usar las medidas de protección personal, eh, ver que, que sí cumplan criterios clínicos y epidemiológicos de caso sospechoso, en un hospital de segundo y tercer nivel notificar al equipo de infectología y epidemiología y asimismo ahí, ahí se puede hacer la toma de muestra para envío a, a, la, a la PCR en tiempo real para diagnosticar SARS-CoV. 
Si se tiene en el centro de atención, ahí mismo se hará, y si no, en un centro de referencia que esté avalado por el Instituto Nacional de Referencia Epidemiológica. La que sigue. Si los pacientes en segundo nivel cumplen criterios de hospitalización ante un caso sospechoso, lo importante es siempre mantenerlo y lo vamos a valorar mediante el SOFA y el NEWS y vamos a saber si requiere terapia intensiva o no. Si requiere una terapia intensiva, debe ir a terapia intensiva, seguir los, las medidas de SIRA y las medidas de precaución e idealmente estar en un cuarto aislado. Y si no requiere terapia intensiva, estar en un, eh, en un, eh, en un servicio clínico eh, donde tenga cuartos aislados y que se cumplan todas las medidas de protección personal para la identificación y el tratamiento del paciente. Si el paciente en un segundo y tercer nivel de atención busca la consulta pero no requiere una hospitalización, se manda a su casa con signos de alarma, principalmente, como dice el círculo de la esquina inferior izquierda, y se le dan datos de alarma a pacientes que tienen factores de riesgos, como ya comentó el doctor que anteriormente presentó los datos clínicos, que tienen factores de riesgo para que la enfermedad progrese a una enfermedad severa. La que sigue. Y finalmente, bueno, la segunda parte es qué estamos haciendo en el, en el Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias, donde somos el Centro Nacional de Referencia de Virus Respiratorios y Neumonías Graves. Pues bueno, aquí estamos viendo la tendencia por semana epidemiológica desde el 2014. Tenemos un, eh, un seguimiento muy estricto de virus respiratorios por PCR de pacientes hospitalizados y vemos que circulan bastantes virus respiratorios. Y dentro de estos, todo el tiempo estamos buscando los coronavirus, como pueden ver, y normalmente estos coronavirus y casi todos los virus respiratorios están en la epidemial en el instituto. ¿La que sigue? Hablando de puro coronavirus en el INER, Ven, eh, hemos tenido casi 200 casos hospitalizados por neumonías o exacerbaciones de POC asma por coronavirus, que principalmente lo vemos en las épocas invernales y los coronavirus pues se distribuyen en los cuatro subtipos, pero el más frecuente que encontramos es el OC43 y el HKU1. La tasa de mortalidad de estos coronavirus en el instituto es realmente muy baja, menos del 2%. La que sigue... Y nosotros, como somos un centro de alta especialidad con pacientes graves, críticamente enfermos, que nos refieren de unidades de primero, segundo y tercer nivel de atención, tenemos un flujograma muy especial, donde muchos pacientes son graves, tienen mayor riesgo de hacer este, gotas eh, por eh, procedimientos o por el cuadro clínico del paciente. Entonces, en nosotros, al inicio, los pacientes en el flujograma llegan a urgencias en un área separada que se tiene específico para COVID-19 y se tiene en triage un consultorio específico sospechoso para COVID-19. En la valoración se hace una evaluación clínica y de la laboratoria exhaustiva para saber si realmente cumple definición de caso con todas las medidas de protección personal. Y ahí mismo se toma el hisopo, eh, doble hisopo nasofaringio para el diagnóstico de, de SARS-CoV-2. Si en la evaluación clínica el paciente requiere ser hospitalizado, tenemos camas definidas para COVID-19 en urgencias. Y si en urgencias, si el paciente no requiere ser hospitalizado y todavía no se hace el, 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 el PCR en tiempo real, se puede enviar a su casa y como se mostró en los flujogramas previos, con datos de alarma y una revisita hospitalaria en 24 horas, si el paciente cumpliera factores de riesgos para progresión de enfermedad severa. ¿La que sigue? En esta otra parte es la toma de muestra y el diagnóstico clínico. La toma de muestra desde urgencia se va en un triple embalaje hacia el laboratorio de microbiología clínica y ahí en microbiología clínica tenemos un flujo muy importante de la muestra que en seis horas, nosotros, en, cuatro, en dos horas, perdón, nosotros podemos diagnosticar influenza y su subtipificación por GeneXpert y más de 20 patógenos respiratorios, virales, bacterianos y micóticos por un film array respiratorio que es una PCR múltiple en tiempo real. Si esto está negativo, nosotros hacemos la PCR de coronavirus que está en cuatro horas y se da informe al clínico. Si está positivo algún virus respiratorio, se manda esa PCR de coronavirus porque cumple definición clínica de caso al INDRE, que es el centro de referencia, pero nosotros ya no lo corremos. Si el paciente tiene un resultado positivo, nos regresamos al flujograma para saber si requiere hospitalización o no tiene un área específica en urgencias y si ven aquí en la esquina superior derecha, ahí está la zona de terapia intensiva. Si el paciente está críticamente enfermo con datos de un CIRA moderado a grave, entonces se asignaron camas específicas en terapia intensiva que son aislados para pacientes de COVID-19. Y ahí mismo en este flujograma les, ponemos, les vamos actualizando la definición clínica acorde a la OMS. La que sigue. 
¿Qué es lo que hacemos en el Laboratorio de Microbiología Clínica del Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias? Recibimos la muestra, hacemos Gene Expert de Influenza y Film Array para esta identificación de 25, más de 25 patógenos en dos horas. En cuatro horas tenemos la PCR de SARS-CoV-2 y al día siguiente confirmamos si tuvo un paciente positivo influenza el, con el protocolo de CDC de Atlanta. Es decir, tenemos un tiempo de respuesta en seis horas para el diagnóstico microbiológico completo de un paciente sospechoso de COVID-19 y principalmente si tiene una enfermedad grave por COVID-19. El laboratorio está abierto a las 24 horas del día, los 7 días de la semana. La que sigue. Estos son dos casos sospechosos que nos han llegado con controles positivos. Nosotros actualmente estamos usando el protocolo de Berlín, eh, ya que fueron sondas que pudimos conseguir, conseguir mediante un proveedor. Hemos tratado de eh, hacer el protocolo de CDC de Atlanta. Solicitamos las ondas, pero no ha sido posible que nos las puedan enviar porque parece ser que ahorita solamente las tienen disponibles para su país. ¿La que sigue? Estas son las ondas que nos llegaron del protocolo de Berlín. ¿La que sigue? Son tres casos que hemos valorado en el laboratorio en el INER. Si se dan cuenta, tres casos con definición operacional, sintomáticos, viaje a China, y los tres, si se dan cuenta, lo que primero debemos de seguir pensando porque tenemos una época de influenza alta en el país, pues es influenza. Dos de estos pacientes, uno influenza A, otro influenza B y el otro una faringitis bacteriana. Los tres negativos a SARS-CoV-2. ¿La que sigue? Esto es el panel que hacemos normalmente en microbiología clínica en el Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias, en el Laboratorio de Virus Respiratorios, donde estamos avalados por el College of American Pathologists y el Instituto Nacional de Referencia Epidemiológica. El CAP nos ayuda para 17 virus respiratorios y la local nos ayuda para influenza. Y ahí tenemos un ejemplo de cómo reportamos en la esquina inferior izquierda los resultados de virus respiratorios en el INER y esto normalmente está en dos horas. La que sigue. Este es un estudio para que vean que nosotros estamos muy acostumbrados a las infecciones por coronavirus. Y a lo que voy con esto es que es un estudio que eh, hicimos de pacientes en los últimos años hospitalizados por coronavirus. Y vean que encontramos, pues fueron casi 40 pacientes hospitalizados, donde los, la mayor parte de ellos tenían una, alguna comorbilidad, como VIH, hipertensión, asma, diabetes, EPOC. Casi todos eran hombres entre los 30 y los, entre los 40 y, 50 y 60 años. La que sigue... Muchos con exactamente lo mismo que presentan los pacientes de COVID-19, principalmente tos, sin expectoración, fiebre, disnea y desaturación. La que sigue. Y si se dan cuenta en este estudio clínico que realizamos, la mayor parte de los coronavirus están en la época invernal. Esto es muy importante porque no sabemos si este COVID-19 también probablemente disminuirá con la entrada del calor a nuestro país y a las Américas. Y vean que, bueno, tenemos una distribución pues de casi todos los, los coronavirus, principalmente OCK43. ¿Qué sigue? Antes que ingresan con coronavirus al INER tienen una neumonía o tienen una exacerbación de asma EPOC como evento clínico al ingreso. ¿La que sigue? Y finalmente, ¿qué es lo que está haciendo el Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias y el Laboratorio de Virus Respiratorio aunado a lo que hace el Secretario de Salud y el Instituto de Referencia Epidemiológico y la Dirección General de Epidemiología? Estamos ya haciendo el diagnóstico a la par del Centro Nacional de Referencia de Coronavirus. Estamos apoyando en diagnóstico y manejo a otras instituciones de ser necesario. Estamos haciendo, como vieron al inicio de la plática, Muchos de los eh, participantes trabajamos en las guías, los lineamientos para el manejo clínico de pacientes COVID-19. Tenemos flujograma, apoyamos a los flujogramas de primero, segundo y tercer nivel y hicimos nuestro propio flujograma por ser un centro especializado de infecciones respiratorias graves. Tenemos un laboratorio de biología molecular, BCL3, donde se puede hacer investigación y es muy importante que ahí no estamos autorizando el cultivo celular. Este viernes inicia un curso nacional de todo el país para capacitadores, Train the Trainers, es el nombre del curso, que vienen de todo el país más de 400 personas y lo verán más de miles de personas en el canal de YouTube del instituto para entrenarse en el manejo clínico de pacientes COVID-19. Neumólogos, infectólogos, enfermeras, enfermeros e investigadores somos parte del grupo del Consejo Nacional de Seguridad y Salud y del Subcomité de Enfermedades Emergentes y estamos apoyando en las decisiones clínicas en el país. Asimismo, se están haciendo sesiones en hospitales de referencia y en, y en, la, en asociaciones de Latinoamérica para que sepan cómo está trabajando este país de Latinoamérica. Y finalmente, seremos, si esto se hace una epidemia, un centro de referencia nacional 
para pacientes graves de COVID-19, como hoy en día lo somos para influenza de cualquier subtipo. La siguiente. Y muchas gracias. Este es el equipo del de Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias que estamos trabajando en el manejo de virus respiratorios y listos para recibir a COVID-19. Gracias. Great, Dr. Orozco, gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you for that great presentation. And uh, we've, we're running a little over, so we're going to go ahead and bring this special COVID-19 learning session to a close. But I want to I wanna thank all our presenters, Dr. Orozco and Dr. Vera from Mexico, and our CDC colleagues, Dr. Uecki, Dr. Molinar, Dr. Scheel, and Dr. Lessa. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. We had almost 400 sites across the U.S., Mexico, Latin America, Africa joining us. And um, I think this was a really excellent use of our, of our ECHO platform to help respond to a public health emergency. So I don't know if Dr. Munoz is still with us, but if she is, Uh, do you want to say any closing comments? Uh, I'm here. Uh, I will say it in Spanish, okay? Great. Uh, muchísimas gracias a todos por este haberse unido a esta sesión especial por coronavirus. Este, pues les agradecemos su presencia y su paciencia para estar aquí con eh, nosotros. Y muchas gracias a todos los presentadores que han estado el día eh, de hoy con nosotros. Thanks to all the speakers that joined us today to make this session possible. Great, and I just want to remind people again to please complete the survey through the link in the chat so you can get your continuing education credits. And also we will send an email out with links to all the PowerPoint presentations by all the speakers. So again, gracias, thank you all, and stay healthy and have a great day. Bye. Gracias. Gracias. Bye-bye. Muchas gracias.